So I'd just like to ask you some questions just talking about the work that you've done in the community. But first of all, I'm going to start with asking you about your professional development in the following areas. So if you'd like to talk to us about your community activism. Well, I think that started some years ago with, in actual fact, with the West Indian Centre at Carmel Road. Um, in those days when there was, we, it was the hub of everything that was going on. So I used to drop in and out at their Saturday school, and, but loads of us used to go there every Friday night because that's where it was happening, when there was activities, campaign in relation to African liberation struggles, that's the place to go to. It was also a place that brought African students and the community together. However, I became more, more grounded when um, Ron Phillips' wife, approached me when I was doing a, a course at Stretford College to do a secretarial course in the sense that my parents worked in a factory so I thought to be aspirational let me work in an office. So I was doing a secretarial course and uh, I bumped into um, Ron's wife and she wanted to find out what I was doing and then she told me that they were setting up the Manchester Black Women's Cooperative in Mosside which is the old St Mary's School which is now the site of a nursery and the former pre um, premises that Abyssinia Cooperative was based at. And the idea of this secretarial um, training was to equip women, in particular young women, young mothers, to develop their office skills training. And so that's when I joined the Manchester Black Women's Cooperative as an employee. And that marked the beginning of my community activism. Because being at the Manchester Black Women's Cooperative, you also, I also became involved with the Amilcar Cabral Saturday Supplementary School. And it was named Amilcar Cabral after the leader of the Guinea-Bissau. He was the leader of Guinea-Bissau and the struggle. And furthermore, we liked the motto about the children are the flowers of our struggle and the principal reason for a fight. So it was a way of motivating us. So whatever we're doing in the community, we're not just doing it for ourselves, we're doing it for our children. And that marked the beginning of me becoming seriously involved with community activism. I didn't work with the, I didn't work with the uh, Pan-African Congress movement. Um, Beanie, Ron, Cecil Gottsmore, Miami, these were all hardcore Pan-Africanist, and Manchester was one of the branches. And because Beanie, um, Barry Edwards, you know, they were the core Pan-Africanist in Manchester. And so their job was to bring along younger people. So they used to have conferences, seminars in Manchester, and we used to go to the annual African Liberation Day events in Birmingham and in London. Because those events were not just conferences, there was also a march to the city. And it was quite hilarious in Manchester. There probably was around 10 of us, but Barry insisted that we march through the city. That was quite hilarious, actually. <laughs> but he, numbers didn't bother him. So, yes, yeah, so it was just part of, part of the community activism. And that was a really important part because it brought us closer. It broke down barriers between the African community and the African diasporic community. And it also created a great interest in not just theoretical, but in the continent as a whole. And that's why most of us that are, are Pan-Africanists have been to the continent, you know, several times, because it became part of your being. Yeah, it was more than Mossad, because right now people think about, people think in a very insular way, you know. You're getting young people who are scared to go beyond their postcode. Um, whereas to us, the world was our oyster. It was really, the struggle was not just about Mossad, Hume or Wally Range. It was a worldwide struggle of which we were part of. But right now it's become so narrowed and therefore I think it's had an impact on our confidence and self-esteem as a people. Um, what I picked up from people like Ron Phillips and other Pan-Africanists is that you have a responsibility to yourself to get whatever qualification is necessary for you to progress. So therefore, that is what led us, that's what led me back into education. And also, it was also a time when a lot of people were returning to education. So for example, Barry Edwards, Fred Frederick, 
and quite a few, and Catholic, they all went back to university and they were at Manchester Polytechnic doing their, and my friend Shirley Innes, who was also passed, they were all at the university doing their youth and community work training. So in talking to them, that kind of inspired me to also go back into education. And I'd started off with the youth and community work course. Then I went to what used to be St. John's in town and it's part of MANCAT and did a couple of A-levels. And then I decided to, do, uh, to apply to Manchester Polytechnic to do their BA social science course. And that was whilst they were still active in the community. So we were studying. So it, the social science course that I was doing, for example, we had a module on developing countries. And so that was quite relevant to a lot of things that you know, we were doing in the community. We were also at a time, Kate, we were also at a time when our parents were talking about small islanders and things like that. And then Africa, wow, you know, that, that was another story. So really it was about breaking down those kind of superficial barriers between the black communities, you know, because as far as I'm concerned, when I'm at school and the teachers don't know whether or not you're from Barbados, Jamaica, Trinidad, Nigeria, all they can see is your colour. But our parents didn't have that experience, so we had that experience. So we were driven to break down those kind of superficial barriers and to, to be part of that common struggle and to know that we have more in common than what is being promoted. The Black Women's Mutual Aid was operating alongside, because this was an initiative of Louise, Eloise Edwards, the Black Women's Mutual Aid. And hers is around bringing um, cultural awareness within the context of the school, within the school curriculum. So for example, she told a story about having spoken to teachers at Juicy about, um, what's that nurse called? The, the one, we've just put a statue up for her. Oh, Mary Seacole. Mary Seacole. And they denied it and they told her that she was simply making it up. You know, so that's how ignorant schools were of black culture. So that really was about promoting black culture within the curriculum. So that was happening alongside the Manchester Black Women's Cooperative. But the Manchester Black Women's Cooperative kind of came to an end because after a while people grow and they develop. And even though it was called the Manchester Black Women's Cooperative, it was really in a sense led by the voice of the more experienced men, as in Ron Phillips. And so we started, we wanted a greater voice, wanted women's voice to be much stronger. And so in the end, we decided to go our separate ways. And out of that came Abyssinda Cooperative. And Abyssinda Cooperative, which became, it's an organize, organization for women, led by women, but for the community. And in, and in so doing, we were able to, the voices of women became more prominent than as was evident in the Black Women's Cooperative. Well, the Roots Festival was, is an annual event and it was held in different schools, but Juicy became the main site of it. In terms of my involvement, it really was about assisting in the organization of the festival. So you'd get people like Will Medine, Ken McIntyre, and everybody that we see now, they're all part of the Roots Festival. They all, everyone was playing their own role in the festival. We also, the festival also complemented the annual Culture Week at, Sport, at West Indian Centre Carmore Road. That com because it was also held one year at, the, at West Indian Centre Carmore Road, but subsequently most of it was held at Juicy High School. But Eloise really was the lead person and she recruited a lot of other younger people to participate in it. The Roots Oral History Project is an outcome of the Roots Festival. So the Roots Oral History Project was about recording the experiences of early migrants. And it was funded by um, maybe manpower and what happened, it was, you know, because the Jewish community, they'd just done a similar project. So Eloise Edwards, Louise Dakakodia, Kath Locke, 
they were the lead people in the development of the Roots History Project. And so there was a team of us, I was the coordinator and there were three other researchers and we were doing very similar to what's happening with the, the Women of the Soil Project. We were contacting people um, and arranging interviews. So for example, one of the interviewed person that we interviewed was a white guy and he used to be, when early immigrants came, he used to be one of the people that used to, you know, the church used to receive early immigrants and he talked about the fact that immigrants weren't able to get jobs like with fruit and vegetable because, you know, people were afraid of the, the colour of their skin. Um, we also talked to um, Mr. Farrow. Mr. Farrow was a Nigerian guy who came here at a very, very early age and he was a staunch Pan-Africanist. We talked to a range of people. We also included my cousin. My cousin is now late. And he was one of the people that was caught up in the demolition of Mosside. And that left a scar on his, on his, because he bought his house. And you know, when they demolished Mosside, his house got demolished. And he said, never again will I buy another house in England. And he never bought another house in England. Whereas Barry Edwards and and his wife, they're the ones who held out a lot on Platt Lane because they totally opposed the demolition of Mosside. So did Cathlock. So the, the Roots History Project represents those kind of, those kind of experiences um, for, of people. But don't forget, they were older than me, so th those were struggles that I heard about. They're not struggles that I participated, but it had an impact on me because we used to live in, on Sloan Street, which is now Sedgeborough Road, 53 Sloan Street, I remember that, and we had one of those houses, and there were big terrace houses with cellar, attic, and all that, and most of the, most of the houses. So what happened is that we're getting young people growing up not knowing how much asset black people had in this area, prior to the demolition, demolition of the area, because everybody that I knew, all the people that I went to school with, all our parents owned their houses, and they were big houses, and those all got lost. So that had an impact on the economic power of the community. That is the impact that it had, and I think that impact still is still there, because that fa kind of financial heritage got lost. So yeah, that's the long-term effects. I don't know if anyone has mentioned it previously because I know you've interviewed Francie and Maria. Um, Abyssindi came out, the, name, the word Abyssindi is a Zulu word for survivors. And we came up with that name because one of our members was from South Africa and her mother was around and we were telling her what we needed to do and then she came up with that name Abyssindi. Um, and hence the, the motto Zizalewe Ukisinda, we were born to survive because we only had the shell of a building. We had nothing else, so it's a means that we had to get going. However, Kath insisted that we do not take any money from the state. And that was a fundamentally a very good decision because it meant that during the riots we could keep open and we didn't have to bother about being closed down because of our funding. So we could do whatever we wanted because nobody was funding us. And in actual fact, one year, so, so nobody was funding us. We decided that part of our fundraising strategy would be culturally based. Hence, we brought on board hair platin. And so hair people would come to Abyssinia to have their hair platted and we'd make a charge. We also decided to sell cultural goods, to sew and make cultural goods such as cushions, tops and dresses, and to also sell African arts and craft. And so that helped to keep the organization going. And obviously, we we're all doing it on a voluntary basis. And as I mentioned earlier, voluntary work, we need to promote voluntary work to young people now because voluntary work, people think in short term, where's the money? But we need to, uh, it's the long term. It brings its own re re um, rewards on a long term basis. It opens up a tremendous avenues. You know, not only does it bring your CVs, it brings you in contact with lots of different people, lots of different communities, lots of different skills. And so it really is important that the money is great but, you know, we have to, but it comes and go on a long term basis. We have to build and voluntary work is a very legitimate way forward. And so, and the, yeah, and therefore the organization got involved. We worked also in, in partnership with 
other organisations. So, for example, we brought over Cistern Theatre Cooperative. And Cistern Theatre Cooperative, they did their performance at 8411. And we did this in partnership with the Women of War and Want. And so we made a joint application for, for funding to fund that specific event. Uh, so, and we did it on the cheap in sense that Cistern, Cistern Theatre Cooperative, they stayed with various people. So two of the women stayed with me and they stayed in different households. So that was, and then in terms of campaign, we worked in partnership with Women's Aid. And we really just stumbled into deportation campaigns. Not stumbled into it because Gus John was one of the first people to have brought um, anti-deportation campaigns in the public arena. And I was involved in that particular case. And so then Abyssinda became involved in other cases. And it's just through conversations, individual conversations with people, you know, and they say such and such a person is in a particular position. We take it to the group and speak to the group and says, is there anything we can do to help? And the group said, OK, we'll talk with the family and speak with the family and then um, speak with other organisations and then develop a strategy in which to go forward. And I must say, most of the campaigns that we've been involved with was successful. Yeah. Of course, at that time, there was um, also um, other elements starting up. Louise Hathakos, yourself, uh, Mosh Rash, who was one of the first chair persons on, on there. Can you tell us a little bit about the other link or activities that were happening maybe with Mosh Rash as well, and what you know of it? Um, Let me see. It's a bit of a jump, really. Okay. I'm, try I'm trying to get my thoughts. Yeah, yeah. Uh, okay. It's, yeah. it's okay. All right. I'll, I'll come back to that. Yeah. Because yeah, it's a time difference. Okay. Yeah. So let's just talk about the... Um, well, sorry. In terms of Louise, mm -hmm. Louise, was, Louise was there. Yeah. Because, like, on the right night, Louise was one of the people, one of the people. I was out of the country, but this is what I've been told. Like, Abyssinda kept his, kept his door open all night. Louise was one of the people who was there ferrying people to the hospital. So, so yes, she was, she was part of it. And I think the work of Abyssindi, the work of Mutual Aid, helped to influence the development of an organisation such as Moshwa. Yeah? Okay. So the, the Saturday Supplementary School, that was part of the development within... Well, it was an ongoing theme because people like Barry Edwards and them, they knew Bernard Ford, who was the one who triggered, who was responsible for the development of Saturdays of Supplementary Schools in England. And that's about his book about how the educational system makes black young people educationally subnormal. And it's that book which triggered black community to start doing their own Saturday supplementary schools. Of course, supplementary schools have been taking place in this country f um, since the Second World War, whereby, you know, the Polish people, Irish people, in order to maintain their identity, the Jewish people, they would have their supplementary schools. But the emergence of black supplementary school started with Bernard Cord, and so it became part of community activism. You don't have a community group without a Saturday supplementary school. That was just part of it. Abin and myself went to Barbados to carry Fester. That was many, many years ago. And when we came back, we decided to apply for a small pot of money to buy drums. Because Abina was also performing. She already had her own group that she performed with. But carry Fester, we were really um, enthusiastic about what we saw in Barbados and decided to kind of see if we can recreate it within the Abyssindi, within the context of Abyssindi. So we did apply for some funds and we, start, we got our two drums and we started developing. At that time, the group was mixed because it was usually Uncle Tommy, um, Taffer, uh, an, another drummer. And so the drummers were men and the dancers were women. However, the people with the power were the men who were the drummers. And so in a sense, they were kind of dictating their voice was the most, more dominant. 
Um, and again, once again, we decided that that's not good enough. If they can drum, we can drum. So we then created all women's drumming and dance group so that we know we're no longer dependent on the men for their drumming because, you know, if they don't want to drum, then we can't dance. So, and that's how come, and, it, and it's grown tremendously since then. Magdalene will know about it. She was one of the key people <laughs> in it, you know, but that, that's the root of it. That's where it came from. And so that again was um, a tremendously, in a sense, Abina introduced me to African culture at that level because I never saw myself as, never, could never envision myself playing drum, could never envision myself doing African dances, could never envision myself making costumes, but I did. I developed those skills, you know, through, through Abisindi. We find adults coming up to saying to us now, oh, I remember you from Abyssinde, and these are adults. And I think that's what inspired Adele and myself to then do the book on Abyssinde, um, Catching Hell and Doing Well, Black Women in the UK, Abyssinde Cooperative. Because more often than not, you hear about the stories that are negative, but our children also hear to have to have a balanced story. Whilst we're catching hell, we're also challenging and we're doing well. And I think that's one of the reasons which led us to tell the story of not only black women's activism, but the activism of a community in Moss Side. I worked with the adult service for a number of years. And then we had reorganization because I was based at, first of all, I was based at Anson Road with a guy called David Gibson, whom I'm sure Tony knows. And then we were also at the one in Moss Side, is it 8411 Centre? But no, there was also the Burley. I was based at Burley before Burley became a field and then it's now MMU. And I think I decided to take redundancy because they were asking people to, you know, they were, doing, they were doing some readjustments. I took redundancy, but I didn't realise how bad the employment climate was. It was bad. And I thought, OK, you've taken redundancy. You're going to find a job tomorrow. But, you know, two years later, you're still job hunting. I thought, wow, this is difficult. So whilst I was job hunting, I decided to enrol on the master's programme because I wanted to find out, because at the time I also, I wanted to find out a bit about the work of the strategy to elevate people's project, which is what we, is a mentoring project started by Whit Stenner, who was former Lord Mayor of Trafford, and he's still currently a councillor, and he's the person that Tony's just recently done some work about. So I really wanted to find out more about that. So I, and Whit was quite in agreement with me doing my research around this particular project. And whilst I was doing it, because I wasn't finding any employment, I realized, and I was paying for the course myself, I was running out of funds. And so we had the Mossad and Hume Task Force, which Louise worked at. And because I was looking at young people who lived in the Task Force area, I thought, let me approach her to find out whether or not the Task Force would be willing to sponsor my, my fees for the second year, or because in order for me to complete the course. So I spoke to her, and then she took it to the committee and came back and it was positive. So they, they agreed to pay my final fees. Um, provider that day had a copy of the report and the idea of the report was that it would also be a foundation from which you know, we would be able to, to attract funding. So that was my first kind of direct contact with Louise, even though I'd been working with her indirectly. And then later on, so that's what I'm trying to say, our links wasn't via Mushraf initially. It was via supporting me. And then subsequently, she invited me to join Karaoke Education Trust, of which she was then the chairperson. However, in between then, I was, when, when I finished the course, a post came up at City College for someone to coordinate the mentor service. And I'd just finished doing this research and mentoring. And somebody told me about the post and I applied for it. 
and I got the post. So I was working with Andy Forbes and a group of other people. And that's when we then, whilst I was employed there, we decided to do the conference, the Women as Role Model Conference. And we were doing it in partnership with Mushraf, um, with MMU, um, with Hideaway, and with a group called Sisters of the, of the Yam. So that was when, that was my first kind of, my second stage of involvement and most significant involvement with Mushraf, that particular conference, the Women as Role Models Conference. And this is a conference which was chaired by Louise herself. And the, the, part, the presenters included Judy Craven, who was teaching at the adult service, um, Professor Carol Baxter, who is still working with the health service, um, Wilma Dean, who is, who is a solicitor, and a number of other local women. And really, it really was about recognizing and celebrating the, the achievements and contributions of black women. And at that time, you know, we're now talking about globalization. Louise was using that terminology in 1997. So she was a woman that really was way ahead of time. In actual fact, most of us at the conference were way ahead of our time. So this is where the link with Mushraf came in, yeah. Can I just say, in terms of Mushraf, so at the conference, everyone was talking about, oh, I saw all these women coming up, talking about wonderful, you know, really clever, confident black women. And then Carol Baxter mentioned about the need to also give, you know, acknowledge our mothers. And I thought to myself, these women, I know their mothers are ordinary, yet these women are so powerful. So I really wanted to find out more about these mothers who are creating these powerful daughters. And so that's what then influenced me to enroll in a doctoral program, because I wanted to find out. But I focused specifically on mothering and on the, on the mothering experiences of three generations of um, Jamaican heritage women. Because I wanted to find out, because I know a lot of their mothers were in blue, they were factory workers, they wouldn't be classified as professionals, but yet they were producing some very impressive professional women. And I needed to find out more about that. So as you can see, the activism is the one that's been constantly influencing my educational development. I went into MMU um, as a lecturer in youth and community work. This was my opportunity to put the black agenda out there. Because we're not just lecturers, we're also black lecturers. And we have a community that also needs, that community needs to be heard. And so, for example, um, the conference on Manchester Black Parents, Children and Young People's Conference, it was about address challenging or highlighting the fact that we, our children are disproportionately being excluded from schools. And as you know, exclusion then leads to exclusion from the, the job market and inclusion within the prison community. That is kind of the, that's, that, that's what happened. And so I think no matter what we do as black people, whatever job we are doing, it is our duty and our responsibility to address the black issues and to ensure that it's being addressed. And you can't, you can't say, I can't make a difference, I'm the only one. You can, even if you're the only one in an organization, you can make a difference. Again, Louise was ahead of her time because there's a woman called Dean, um, a, a postgraduate student from Jamaica, who got funded, who PhD got funded by Carioca Education Trust. And her job was to do a research around the experiences of black boys, black pupils, in particular boys within schools. And one of her findings is, is that you will find that black students are concentrated in particular courses. So for example, we're underrepresented in IT, medicine, finance, in that area. And one of the reasons why we're underrepresented is that most of the people are returning to education. So they've, you know, so there's been, they've returned to education. So going on like others, 
the white students that go to their GCSEs, A-levels and straight to university. That's in a lot of cases, that's not been the case for a lot of black students. So therefore, they're limited in terms of the type of courses that they can apply for. And I think it's this reason why Louise set up Karaoke Education Trust to support black students who were enrolled on non-traditional areas of studies like medicine, finance, IT, engineering, because it's about increasing our representation at that level. If I go back to Louise, right, Louise Dakakoji, she passed away in 2008. And in relation to what you're saying about celebrating and raising awareness, that is the reason why we've got the Louise Dakakoji Education Trust. Because it is about celebrating and raising awareness about black women's achievements and contributions. And it has been a challenge establishing a trust. Because we're establishing it when... Because in a sense, the community key into one person. And, we, you know, so we, we're having a Louise Dakakoji trust without a Louise. So these are some of the challenges that we, that we kind of face with. We also face with challenges of financial challenges, putting forward the message about the need to recognize and support the work of women in the sense that Saturday schools are dominantly staffed by women. You know, and so in that respect, that's an example of, I think that's an example of challenges that we're currently faced with. I see the WAS project as an ongoing part of our history, really. So we can take in, a, if you want to take it within the arts sector, it can go in within the arts sector. You know, if you can do further research, it can, if you're talking about publication, all those options are open. It's up to us, you know, which direction we want to take WAS. But WAS is ongoing, and I think it should become embedded in our activism.